Good afternoon. I want to begin by saying thank you to Pastor Wayne Powers and his lovely church at Freedom Worship Center for welcoming us last week. They were so gracious to us and they gave us a beautiful offering and they're always so kind. And of course, Pastor Wayne and Kathy, we love them very much. Pastor Wayne is one of my inner circle of people, of advisors and people that co can correct me and speak over my life. I told a pastor last night, I said, if I'm biblically wrong, I said, the janitor can correct me. I said, or, or you know, anyone. I said, but uh, I don't want everybody uh, kind of up in my face. And I know you kind of feel the same way. We all do. But I, I want to say <clears throat> to all of you, thank you so much for all that you give. I say so very little about money until sometimes I feel like I'm impolite. But I want to say thank you for all that you give. And thank you for all that you do. And thank you for your prayers. We would not be here if it weren't for some of your prayers that prayed for us at that darkest hour. And you prayed for us and the Lord brought us through. And I, I'm thankful for that. And I want to say thank you. We have just enjoyed a wonderful week with my in-laws. And they were here. We got to do a lot of praying together. And that's always good. And I um, enjoyed them being here. It was good. And so uh, I still have some issues with this matter in Mississippi that are being dealt with. So uh, they look like they're coming to fruition, but I don't want to drag it out forever. So please pray for us. It's just a matter of uh, doing the right thing. Just, you know, everybody following what the words of what the law says on the matter. And so, but you know, sometimes people don't, don't like to do that. So uh, but just pray for us, and we need your prayers. And this morning, I thought about my friend, Tony Wingate. Tony Wingate is um, one of the praying is people I know and stays in the word. And he uh, he said to me the other day, I was asked, telling him how I wanted him to pray for Pastor Wayne. He's one of my prayer partners, and I was telling him how I wanted him to pray he said, brother, I'll do it if you'll pray that some of it will come down here. And I knew what he meant. They needed a fresh touch of God. And I'm going to say it plainly. The greatest need in the whole world today is revival. The greatest need in the whole world today is revival. We don't need bigger bombs. We don't need a bigger army. We don't need this, that, or the other or more welfare programs, or whatever the case may be. But we are in desperate need of a move of God. <clears throat> we are in desperate need of a move of God. So we will address this in just a moment. Again, thank you for your giving. Just a hint that helped me early on. Uh, tithing is to be a first fruits. It ought to be the first check you write. And I, I want to say this to you. If money makes you uptight, you need to go before God and ask him why. Because it doesn't seem to make him uptight. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, you might want to find out if you're greedy or not. That could be the problem. Or if you just don't trust God or anybody else. And you might want to check on that. But um, tithing has always been a first fruit. You know, when I got said, I don't like the word tithing. Really, I've never paid my tithes in my life. I've never given that little. And so uh, I admonish all of you who are figuring God down to the penny. I'll tell you, like I was taught, if you put a pencil to God, he'll put a pencil to you. And people ask me, well, do you pay on the gross or the net of your check? I said, I, I'm the wrong person to talk to because I've, I've never figured it that close. I just give and give abundantly. I had a gentleman call me this week and he said he was passing by a certain place in a certain city and said he remembered that I had done such and such for him. And uh, he just began to thank God for me. And I, I couldn't help but in reading, just so happened my daily Bible reading crossed through 2 Corinthians this week. And I love it when he said that by your giving, 
when you help somebody that needs it, that it causes thanksgiving to be made unto God. So by your giving and by your provision for this ministry and other ministries, you, you cause worship to go up to God. You cause praise to go up to God. And I want to say for some of you, thank you, because I know your money is coming on the right day every month and, and my bills are kind of placed out accordingly and all the extra giving we try to do is placed out accordingly. And I just I just thank you. I just ad admire you and, and, and I love you and I love you that don't give. But I want to tell you something. It's not right to listen to a ministry and not give. It's just not proper. Paul said that uh, the workman is worthy of his hire. And uh, that doesn't mean I want you to quit listening if you're just determined to be an old skin flint. But I do think you ought to listen to the word of God and, and get involved in that. And uh, I, at Christmas time, I had some extra money I wanted to give away. And I called a pastor locally and I said, do you have someone in your church who is a giver that I can give this sum of money to that's in need. And he called me back in a few days. He said, no, he said, I got a bunch of people I'd like to have it. He said, but none that are givers. And I said, I have a problem giving God's money to people who will not give themselves. Now you may disagree with that, but that's okay. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to second Kings chapter six. My friend Tony Wingate told me about several months ago, I guess I got Tony on my mind because his mama's been sick. And I've been praying for her. And he said he went through his old Bible the other day from when he met me 30 years ago. And he said this long series of miracles in first and second Kings, he said that I had preached. He said how they had formed him and transformed him into believing in the miraculous. And you that know me know I am a man that believes in the miraculous. I serve a God that can do things nobody else can do. I serve a God that has done things for me nobody else could do. I serve a God that has, as the psalmist said, he brought me up and he stood me up on a solid rock. And he put a song in my heart, even praise under our God in a time when the whole world had given up on me. Now, you all know summer's a dangerous time to be around me because I got saved in August. And so I get into this mode. I get to thinking about how good God is and how big God is and how glorious and gracious God is. And I, I just get kind of overwhelmed. I really do. And you know, I, I've got a group of eight kids. They're not kids. They're all full adults in their 30s and 40s. And I'm praying for them to be saved. And I've kind of got my, my sights on them, as the old folks would have said. And I've got two of them that are about to come to fruition. And I am overjoyed. And I know God's working on the others. And so I just admonish you. Don't ever give up on your children or your grandchildren. Stand between them and the devil and say, they are mine and they will be God's and you're not going to have them. I'm going to tell you something. That's the only hope some of them have is for you to stand between them and the devil and say, no, it's not going to happen on my watch. Second Kings chapter six. Let's pray before we read. Now, Father God, I just feel so joyful this morning and at peace. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for peace. I want to thank you for joy. I want to thank you for carrying my in-laws the first leg of their trip home safely with no problems. I want to thank you for bringing all the good people that came over to Pastor Wayne's. You brought us all safely and without problem. God, I pray that the blessing of the Lord is upon each of those that heard the message last week, either over the internet or live. God, I pray that we would all realize we need a fresh touch of God. We need a fresh touch of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. Would you give me the anointing that makes preaching easy and effective? Help my thoughts to stay on subject. Help my words to be concise. And Lord, I'll give you praise and honor and glory. Amen. I have lately haven't been taking a whole lot of time to talk to you. That's why it took about nine minutes, 49 seconds this morning. 
Uh, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 6. And let's talk about recovering the cutting edge, recovering the cutting edge, or the swimming axe head. I love that, man. It said the axe head swam. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us, too small. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where ye may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered and said, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe fell into the water, and he cried, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore, he said, Take it up to thee, and he put out his hand and took it. I love that passage. I love it. There's so many different ways to look at this. I want to tell you what he didn't lose. He didn't lose the handle. He lost the cutting edge. He didn't lose the ability to know how to cut wood. He still had the mind. He didn't lose the strength to cut wood. He was still plenty strong. But he lost his edge. He lost that cutting edge. I look at us today. And last week, my final thing was about Elisha and his bones raising a dead man. So I guess I've got Elisha on my mind and Tony Wingate on my mind. Elisha, I love him. Man of a double portion. What a powerful man. What a powerful man. He has, in the preceding chapter, he's seen God heal the leprosy of name of the leper just through his words. He has seen his trusted servant, Gehazi, backslide and go running after money. There's nothing that breaks the heart of a man of God more than to see one of his people backslide. There's nothing that crushes my spirit more than the thought that people who listen to me and have heard me multiple times are no longer serving God. I've never had anybody to leave me and to go do better. I've had a lot of them to leave me and try to fake it for a while, but then the truth shows up. You see, usually it comes down to this. They've got an area of their life they don't intend to deal with, and God intends for them to deal with it. And so they they just try to let it slide or let it pass, and it doesn't slide, and it doesn't pass, and it doesn't get better. And Gehazi chased after Naaman. He said, oh, we had a little episode there. Said the man of God wouldn't take anything from you, but said, I'll take a little something. And I love it when Gehazi comes back, he tries to hide it. And Elisha said, uh, did you not think my heart went with you when you went out? So I'm going to say it to those of you who are not living holy, who are watching pornography or whatever the case may be. <clears throat> maybe you've got an attitude, or maybe you murmur and complain and gripe all the time. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're greedy. Don't you know that my heart goes out with you every time you fail? Every time you choose sin over your Savior, my heart goes with you. And you wonder sometimes why I'm so stringent. It's because you're hurting God's feelings and you're hurting my feelings. We want the best for you. And when you do like Gehazi, I know you will bear the marks of it. Gehazi chases his name and down and takes his money. And then Gehazi is expelled. The hypocrite is exposed. And I want you to listen to me. The hypocrite is exposed. And so when the hypocrite is exposed, the kingdom always expands. I can't help but wonder what would happen in the church today if we rid it of hypocrisy. 
I can't help but wonder what would really happen if we rid the hypocrisy and our own excuses about our hypocrisy. What an expansion that would be. Matter of fact, it grew so much, they had so much new blood come in, and I love new blood. New blood is a fun thing. They always have new ideas and new ways, and they're just so happy to be saved, and I love that stupid look that gets on their face. I've had that look for a long time, most of you know. I kind of have not let much of it go. And I love them. They are so fervent and excited and 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 sometimes unwise, but man, they're fervent. And they come in and they, they, they the church starts expanding. Literally the lecture hall was what was expanding. They said, or it needed expanding. They were filling up the building. They said, they went to the man of God. I love it. They didn't do it on their own. They didn't go off willy-nilly starting to do things and then ask him to bless it. That's what most people do. They go their own way and then they uh, get in a mess. They get in a mess and they want God to bless it at a later time instead of walking in the victory. And <clears throat> I love it. They are, um, they are very cognizant that the man of God in their presence has a double portion. They're very aware he's not <clears throat> the average little preacher on the corner. And, and I love it. They, they come in with all that new blood and willingness to work and desire. And, well, one thing I've never seen, I've never seen a real new convert that you had to tell to be there on work day. I've never seen a real new convert you had to talk into worship. I've never seen a real con new convert that you had to talk to beg them to give. Honey, when I first got saved, I, I would take the newspaper back in those days and read and see where there might be going to be a meeting at that I could attend. And I went to everything. I didn't care if they praying for barren women. I went to the altar. I, I, I went all because I was so fired up and excited and I had a willingness to work. And so as the growth of the school of the prophets come, we noticed that Elisha, is influencing the landscape around him. I pray to God that I am making a difference everywhere I go. I want everybody to be influenced by the anointing upon my life. And so we, we are desperately in need of leadership today that are influencers. We use that term a lot today in the technical world. Person is an influencer. I want to be an influencer. I want you to be an influencer for the kingdom of God. I want you to influence people into wanting more of God by your behavior and your attitude. And so we have the new people here in the place they're willing to work and yet they're still under the authority of the man of God. Now I want you to listen to me. Just because you're zealous doesn't mean you can go off and do anything you want to. Now, this type of submission has not been taught in the church in a long time. But if you are under the authority of a real man of God, he's not trying to make a slave out of you. He's not trying to make you get permission to cut your yard, but he is trying to nudge you and provoke you to good works. The Bible says to provoke one another to good works. And so the young preachers and the prophets, they seek his permission before they go, and, and I love it, they are dependent upon his anointing. I once had a group of people were telling me how wonderful their pastor was, and I knew the guy, and he's okay. And I said to him, and they were real big on their grandchildren, and I said, well, you love those grandbabies, don't they? said, I do. I said, well, your pastor, and I called his name. I said, uh, if that grandbaby was dying, and, and the doctor shook his head and said he had not seen the light of day, I said, do you trust him to deliver you a live baby come daylight? They looked and they said, well, we, we know some people. Maybe, maybe there's some in the church. I said, no, no, no. And see, this is the pressure that's on us that are anointed. Peter and John told the lame man, look on us. And he expected to receive something from them. The world and the church have a right to expect something from us. Does that mean I'm a magic act? No. Does that mean I can make God do it my way or your way every time? No, I can't make God do anything. But the good news is he's willing 
and he's able. It's time that we take the goodness of God and the willingness of God and the power of God off of trial. People say, try God. I said, no, 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 you don't have to try God. He's already been tried. And so perhaps they knew the lesson of the psalmist, except the Lord build the house, the labor's in vain. And so they are going to apply the anointing, and I can't help but love Elisha. They said, we won't want to go if you don't go. And he said, I'll go. And so we have a, a unity there. And I want you to listen to me. It's a multi-generational unity. And it's a multi-level unity in the things of God. They're young. They got the zeal. They got the strength. They got the want to. But they need the wisdom of the old man. They need the wisdom of the man of God who spent 13 years at Gilgal going in a circle he knows what it's like to waste time. And so while the iron is hot, if you will, he takes off with them. And so I, I couldn't help but notice the young prophet. How did he lose the cutting edge? Well, how'd you lose yours? By being busy. He was busy in the Lord's work when he lost his edge. He was busy in the Lord's work and he quit being so sharp. Ecclesiastes 10.10, 10, except the iron. He says, if the iron be blunt, if the iron be blunt, you must put forth more strength unto it. The reason most of you are tired all the time, the reason most of you are exhausted all the time, is you're trying to accomplish the perfect will of God in the flesh. You are trying to accomplish everything in the flesh. You think if I pray a little more, if I read a little more, if I give a little more, it'll get better. No. I do agree we all need to pray and read and give more, but this is not performance-based religion. Miracles are not given based on my performance. Miracle, miracles are given really based on my helplessness Really, if I were going to just teach on miracles, I'd tell you this, that a miracle must be predicated by a crisis. There must be a crisis and there must be the gift of helplessness. There must be that utter dependence upon God. And I don't know what to do. I've tried everything with my kid. I've sent them to every rehab there is all over the world. I've spent money on them. I've encouraged them. I've begged them. My marriage is a shambles. I'm tired of crying. I'm tired of praying. I'm tired of this. My finances, they are pitiful. And some of you could honestly say I've been a tithe payer for 50 years. And I don't know how my money got in this shape. Some of us, it's marriage, or some of us, it's our business. My business is dwindling, and I am a giver, and I am helpless, and I am hopeless at the moment, apart from the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need Jesus. I need Jesus and his immediate intervention. I need Jesus to heal while I speak. I need Jesus to provide while I speak. I need Jesus to put some of your marriages back together while I speak. I need Jesus to heal while we speak. My God, I feel his unction coming. I believe you can get a miracle before I end this message. I believe your back can be healed, Gladys, before we get to the end. I believe you can have your healing, Shirley. Not because you've struggled, not because you've strained, but because you are at the point of saying, if you don't do it, I don't have anybody else to go to. No doctor can fix what's wrong with me. No amount of money can fix what's wrong with my kid. No amount of this, that, or the other can fix it. I need Jesus. And I love it. Elisha is a type of Jesus because he had a double portion. John said Jesus possessed the spirit without measure. He said, he whom, he said, he who sent me spoke to me and said, the one whom you see the spirit descend and remain upon. He is the one. He is the one that will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. 
Now you listen to me good. When you lose your cutting edge, stop. My God, stop. When you are hopeless, when you feel hopeless, when you feel helpless, when you feel you can't go on, stop. 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 And confess your need. I cannot help but wonder what would happen in every church in America this morning if when the choir director was trying to lead the singing and God was not there, if he stopped and confessed his inadequacy. I can't help but wonder what would happen all over this land if the preacher was preaching or teaching and the anointing was not there if he didn't just stop and confess him. Stop and confess I've lost the power to cut trees. I can keep swinging this stick, but I'm going to look stupid. We can keep on singing and keep on preaching and go through the motions, and we will never accomplish anything for the flesh profiteth nothing. And we can do that all the days of our lives, but we will never be effective in the work of the kingdom of God or effective in our lives having the fullness of divine order. And so I, I look at him. He's swinging. Now I want you to listen to me good. Your axe head didn't just fall off overnight. You didn't backslide overnight. You didn't start sinning overnight. You didn't lose your temper overnight. You didn't do any of that. You didn't start lusting, being greedy overnight. If you'd be honest, the head was getting loose and you just weren't paying attention. You just thought if I just keep on swinging and swinging and you never stop to sharpen your ax. And so the harder you swung, the more loose it became. Most of you have been a long time since you've stood still and allowed God to put a file to you. Most of you have been a long time since you stood still and let God put a file to you and sharpen you. You just think if I work hard, most of us are, are hardworking people. And you think if I just work harder or give more or do this, honey, I've been so guilty that I have to confess my sin. And so there are lessons here. Are we paying attention? It's our connection. Let me say it plain. Is your connection to the edge as sharp as it's ever been? Is it secure? It must not only be secure. Your edge has to be sharp, but the handle, the connector, your relationship, your intimate relationship with God must be secure. Is your ax head wobbly and you just don't want to admit it? You're afraid somebody will see it and think less of you? Doesn't matter. So he lost his power, and I want you to listen to me. He lost it quick, and it was gone. It was sudden, and it was over. One minute he was cutting a tree, and the next minute he was down by the Jordan looking for his axe head. And the Jordan at that part of the world is deep and fast. It fell into deep water. Some of you have fallen in deep sin. Some of you have allowed garbage and crimes against God to build up until you've not only weren't paying attention, you not only weren't sharpening your ax, it's fallen in deep, deep waters and the flowing waters I may have that will wash it away to where you will only have a distant memory <clears throat> and an empty stick in your hand saying, I used to be sharp. I used to pray for the sick. I used to prophesy. I used to interpret messages. I used to pray for miracles and they came. But now I've lost my cutting edge. The Mindy lost his work or his edge. The work became futile. It became formality. You see, when the spirit of God is grieved, he departs. When we grieve him by worldly methods, he departs. <clears throat> And we wind up like Samson. We shake ourselves, but we don't know that the power has departed. And he lost his cutting edge. And we've already covered not keeping it sharp. 
We must keep our compassion sharp, our mercy sharp, our tenderness sharp. And I don't mean sharp in the sense of hurting people's feelings. But our, our love for people, our compassion, our mercy, our prayer lives, our giving, all, it all has to be kept sharp. And that takes time in prayer with God. You can't run in for a perfunctory five-minute prayer meeting. So most people, and I confess my edge that's missing a little bit. And that's the edge of travail and agony. It's something I talk to the Lord about frequently. I, I want there was a time I've stood before thousands and preached and sobbed uncontrollably over the condition of their souls. I don't ever want to lose that. I've travailed for most of you and for most of your children until my, my insides hurt. And that's why the miraculous is there. I don't expect you to come up here and live on this level, but you need to decide what's missing in your life. What's not what it ought to be. I got a call yesterday from a young man. I spoke to a young man. I called him in Monroe, Louisiana. And he said he and a preacher friend of his were listening to the sermon last Sunday and said they laughed and said, my God, that's the old brother Pilgrim. I said, there wasn't ever anything wrong with Brother Pilgrim said he was sick. He had to get well enough to be able to preach that way. But I told them last Sunday, me coming as an anointed vessel and them making a demand upon that anointing are two entirely different things. Elisha could have stood there all day long walking in a double portion, but when the young man made a demand upon his master, and I want you to look at the shock and the awe in him. He says, alas, Master, he says, oh, no, I've lost the cutting edge. Oh, my God, what have I let happen? I've lost my fervency in worship. Oh, my God, what's happened to my preaching? What's happened to my singing? What's happened to my teaching? What's happened to my Bible reading? What's happened to my compassion for others? What's happened to my tenderness towards others? What's happened in my willingness to work? Have I tried to replace it with an offering? Am I too good to work for the Lord so I just write a check? Or have I lied to myself and say I'm more valuable making money? Have you lost the cutting edge? And if so, why doesn't it horrify you? Like it would horrify me. I remember hearing Dr. Matthew Brady make the comment after reading simply the book of Acts one morning, the first chapter, and he said, I suppose like most of you, I could cry out this morning, I need a fresh touch of the Holy Ghost. I need a deeper walk. I need a more travailing walk. I want a more agonizing walk. I want to really be broken before God, for he is with those who are, he is near those who are broken in a contrite spirit. That word contrite means ground to powder. And God knows I've been through enough. I know he's done that, so I know he's near. I love people, and I love God. Most of all, I love God, and therefore I love people. But I'm tired of watching most of you live defeated. I'm tired of watching you be sick. I'm tired of your children being lost. I'm tired of your marriage being in trouble. My soul is heavy this morning. Cry out to him, alas, master, I've lost the cutting edge. Alas, master, I've lost the ability to accomplish your purpose. Alas, master, my faith is not as sharp as it used to be. My obedience is not as instant and implicit as it ought to be. Alas, master, when prayer becomes perfunctory, rather than a razor edge experience where you come out saying, I love what they said about the disciples. They said they took note of them. They were but ignorant and unlearned men, but they had been with Jesus. There's nothing I like better than hearing somebody lead worship that's been with Jesus. 
There's nothing I like better than hearing someone preach that has been with Jesus. And you see, our fervent mercy happens in his presence. Compassion happens because his character becomes applied to us. And so we lose our edge by being so busy. And I know this upsets most of you, and I just seem to be on it and won't let it go. If you are too busy to pray, if you are too busy to stay with him in prayer until he sharpens you back up or you recover what is lost, then you're too busy. God doesn't need you to make that much money. God's got the cattle on a thousand hills and the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the gold is mine and the silver is mine, saith the Lord. And I appreciate people that, that do things for the kingdom, but don't get so busy fulfilling one aspect of ministry, you leave off everything else and you begin to justify it. That's no good. And so when you lose it, there's a great possibility it may be lost forever. When you lose the cutting edge, there are very few people I've ever seen truly recover it. When you lose what God gave you at great cost of the blood of his son, you see, the Holy Ghost is a blood-bought gift. And when you lose the touch of God on your life, it may look like it's lost forever. And you'll never accomplish anything. You may have lost it through pride or self-aggrandizement, self-interest, unguarded prosperity is one of the quickest ways I see people lose it. I, I, I saw this the other day, Dr. J. Henry Jowett. He said, that there was a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And he brought out that the cloud covered them in the light of blessing. When everything's clear, when you can see what you're looking for, when everything's going your way, you still need a covering to keep you from thinking like Nebuchadnezzar, look what I have done. Look what I have built. Look what I have accomplished. And so we must be careful in times of prosperity and we must, the moment your ax head becomes loose, please pay attention. Stop making excuses about it and stop and secure it and make sure the connection is good. He lost 0.4 of what was not his own. It was borrowed. May I remind you that the blessings of the Lord are his to give, not yours to own. And the fact that you think you own what you own, you're goofy, whether it's material or spiritual. The fact that you don't realize it is gifts from God and every good and perfect gift come from the Father of the heavenly lights in whom there is no variable, there's no turning of shadow. He lost what wasn't his. Have you lost what was not yours? And he said, alas, master, it was borrowed. And he said, I'm too poor to replace it. I don't have enough money to replace what has fallen to the bottom of that river. He said, I feel helpless. I feel hopeless. I have no hope except to come to you, master, and let God show us what to do. And I can't help but think of Jesus. He's when he rose from the dead, he said, all power on heaven and earth is given unto me. Now, the rational thinkers, I read many commentaries that said the rational thinkers just hate this story. They said it is an impossibility for an iron ax head to swim. It is an impossibility to drop it to the bottom of a deep river with a heavy current and it be in the same place. That's how big my God is. And can I tell you one better than that? He cares that you've lost your edge. He cares that you can't accomplish it anymore. He cares that you feel hopeless. He cares that your heart is hurting. He cares that you've worried about that child who you can't worry anymore. Psalmist said, all power belongs unto God. When Jesus went, he said, I want to give you a little something. Take this with you. He said, take my name with you. And he said, when you go in the power of my name, heal the sick, raise the dead, make new converts. He said, don't let anything stop. He said, 
snakes try to bite you, that'll be cool, won't hurt you. Poison won't kill you. He said, but it's borrowed. It is given to you. And as long as you treat it correctly and you reverence me correctly, it'll work. But the day you stop doing that is the day he will depart from you like a dove in flight. You cannot possess him, but I want to assure you he does possess me and he does possess some of you. And so have you lost the wonder working? Have you lost the gift of God that was once in your life? <clears throat> Let us cry out with this young prophet. Alas, master. Alas, I'm in trouble. I can't afford to replace it. There's not a store that sells them. And I don't have the money. We say, well, I lost axe head. I just run down to the store and buy a new one. Yeah, if you had the money and there was a store. But you see, your loss is dependent upon the state it leaves you in and finds you in. The fact that he had to borrow an axe in the first place tells me he didn't have much money. Now, some of you could drop a $20 bill <clears throat> in a store somewhere and might not even notice it. For others, it was their grocery money and they would suffer and struggle. It all matters on how dependent you are upon the object. Me personally, I am a needy child. And me personally, I am a dependent child. And me personally, I can't live without the cutting edge. I can't live without the fervency of the Holy Spirit of God. I can't live without revelation. I can't live thinking maybe he'll answer a few of my prayers. They've laughed at me forever and said, you think he's going to answer them all, don't you? I said, I don't pray. I'm thinking he won't. Of course I do. Do you get them all answered? No, I'm not God. I get a lot of them answered, and I've had enough answered to keep on praying. Then he was painfully conscious of the loss, and the minute that act said disappears, we've already touched a little on this. And I just say this real plain. Why don't you know that the church in America has lost her cutting edge? Are you so hooked on the spirit of nostalgia as long as they keep singing, I'll fly away? You think that's having a move of God? Or God forbid, are you so relevant to the wonderful fact that you never sing a hymn at your church? makes you really above and beyond all the rest of us who preceded you. My goodness, what a level of ignorance. You younger people need to learn. We need you and you need us. And together we are a formidable force, but separate we can't accomplish near as much as we can if we allow God to weld us together. I need young people and young people need me and we need to be linked together rather than dividing over generational things. And so we must understand uh, we simply need to read this and realize this is a multi-generational thing and a multi-socioeconomic thing. And I'm going to say it to you plain, God wants a multi-racial thing going on. And Jacob said the sheep, some of them were spotted and some of them were streaked and some were solid colored. So I think that's okay. And so what a beautiful picture of the unity. Anybody can see this taking place and, 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 and quit freaking out. Young people, you need to quit freaking out because we may have a little insight better than you. And old folks, you need to realize these young people may have new blood that you need. They may have a freshness that you used to have but yours dropped down at the Jordan. And so together we can recover it. the wisdom of the man of God and the direction of the man of God. But the take it of youth made a strong bond right there. And so I want to come to that. And so we get rid of all these generational divides and all these other denominational divides and all this sectarianism and you're a Baptist and I'm a Pentecostal and I'm a Presbyterian and you're a Lutheran. That's all from the devil anyway. It's time we realize there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body. And so it's time for us to walk in this. There's nothing sillier 
than listening to unanointed singing and unanointed preaching. There's nothing sillier than somebody not having the gumption and the spiritual awareness to stand up and say, alas, master, I have lost my cutting edge and it was not even mine. It was on loan from God himself. Anyone can read the book of Acts and see that the greatest lesson on church growth is have a move of God. Acts chapter 2, 3,000 saved. Acts chapter 5, 5,000 saved. Healings, miracles. On, and then he goes down and said they just quit numbering them. He said in the beginning, he said they added to the church daily such as should be saved. In the end, he said that multitudes were added. So they went from addition to multiplication. If you want your, your ministry and your church to go from addition to multiplication, have a move of God. Not everybody's going to want it, but there are some people who will. And so he immediately appealed to his master. We need to stay under authority at all times. So we've lost the cutting edge we've set in worship and compassion, mercy, servanthood. But I got to have it back. I can't do anything without the edge. I can't accomplish anything without the edge. If Elisha had not been prepared to see a miracle, then chances are these young men would have never been taught to expect a miracle. So I'm talking to you, man of God. If you want the people to believe, I remember a little girl in my church one time she was a little dainty girl and she had a wart on her finger and she came to me and held it up and she said, Pastor, will you pray this will go away? And I prayed. And the first thing she did was look to her little finger to see if it was gone. I'm ashamed to say that it wasn't. No, I'm not the wart healer, but I know God is. But I was amazed at that child's faith she expected if she came to her pastor, she would get an answer and get help. That's the kind of pressure that's on me. I told the Lord yesterday, another one of my youngins is sick with her back and different ones. And I uh, told the Lord, I said, they're, they're becoming a great number of them and I don't keep list and I don't read list. I like to have you direct me and show me what to do. And uh, what I really need is a wave of healing. What I really need is a wave of salvation. What I really need is a wave of joy. What I really need is an overflow of the overflow. And I need you to make sure my conduit's clean. Not that I think you would withhold healing from somebody over my silliness. I'm not that dumb. But I want to be ready instantly when the need arises and Elisha was instantly prepared. <clears throat> God is acutely aware. And I love it. We come to the end. It was miraculously restored. The only hope we have as an individual, as a family, as a ministry, as a body of Christ is for God to miraculously have mercy on us, for God to take pity on us and say the poor babies have been singing and jumping and bouncing and preaching without me so long they don't know the difference anymore. But surely to God, there's somebody in every church that would stand up and say, alas, master, we've lost it and it was borrowed. It belonged to you. It was yours. And he lost it. So he reaches and cuts a branch. Why is that important? He cuts a stick, which is a branch. Isaiah 11, 1 says the branch is Christ. The only hope for recovery is Jesus. The only hope for recovery is Jesus. And I love it. It said he threw the stick in the Jordan and for a moment it disappeared. But on the third day, if you will, it ascended and led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. It was the cross. 
we must get back to the cross and confess our own inabilities and say the power of God is in the cross. The blood flowed from the cross for healing, for salvation, for deliverance. The word for salvation is sozo. It means body, soul, and spirit, even your raggedy mind, even your tired brain, your burnout emotions is all in Jesus. The Christ, the anointed one that breaks every yoke. He said, where'd you lose it? He said, what's that got to do with anything? He said, because it'll be right where you lost it. When did you decide you didn't need a prayer life? When did you decide you didn't need compassion? When did you decide you didn't need to care? It's right there. Go back and pick it up. And I love it. He throws in the branch. It may have been lost to worldliness, may have been lost to worry. Oh, God, so many of you are so anxious and uptight all the time. You never just trust him. You never just walk in the peace of God. And others of you are so worried about being busy so that you can look important. Busy, 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 busy. So that everybody will know I'm this, that, and the other. Okay, God bless you. We're glad you're busy. Is it helping you spiritually? If not, slow down just a little. Pump your brakes. Your victory, your joy, your peace, your strength, your marriage, your children, your business itself can be helped more by going back to where you lost the edge and recovering it miraculously than it can be by putting forth more effort. So it slipped off when we weren't paying attention the devil's always subtle that way. And we give recognition to the fact it never was ours to begin with. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from high. And I will pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter whom the world cannot perceive because it knoweth him not, but ye know him, for he shall be in you, and he shall be with you, the paraclete. Now I'm going to say it to some of you. Some of you have lost the cutting edge through self-aggrandizement and liking being big daddy and big mama. You like fixing everything. And what you need to do is say, alas, master, it was part. I am in horror what it would be like to do ministry without the anointing. I am in horror that I might stand up to preach and him not be there. You say, how do we get it back? First, confess it's gone. Second, convince, confess that you didn't pay attention. Third, confess that it was borrowed. Fourth, go back to where you lost it. And five, reach out and take it. The Bible said that the iron swam. Now you don't have to like this. It can upset your theology. I don't care. And I thought now if it fell to the bottom and if the current carried it downstream, but the man of God gave the word of God that it would be at that place then you listen to me. I don't care if it floated 38 miles down the Jordan River. It swam back to the place where it was lost. An axe head swam and Elisha, in an effort to have a teaching moment, told the young man, he said, I've done all I'm going to do. I have provided the connection. I have ministered the word of the Lord. Now reach out and take it. And he reached and snatched it up. And I believe he put it back on that head and made on that axe handle and made sure it was secure. And he kept on going. So I'm going to say it to you plain. It may look like you've lost it. It may look like you lost it in deep, fast water and it's 38 miles away. I don't know. But if you'll obey the word of the Lord, if you'll believe the word of the Lord, I don't care if the ax head has to swim from here to Minneapolis 
for you to recover. You will recover, and I can't help but think of David and Ziklag. Pursue, for you shall surely recover all. I am convinced that God is looking for a remnant of people that will say, I refuse to keep swinging a dead stick. I'm convinced that God is looking for a people that will say, I can't fix my marriage. I can't save my kids. I can't fix my money situation. I want you to know I am horrified, Master, over the shape I've let myself get in. I wasn't paying attention, and I've let the cutting edge get away from me. What do I do? I've given you the points, but the final one is from the time of John the Baptist unto now. Hey, hallelujah. The kingdom of God suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. You got to look the devil in the eye, stand and look at him and say, that edge was a gift to me from God, and I'm not letting you just take it from me, and I'm not letting me let it slip without crying out for help. You got to make up your mind, I will live in peace. I will have my children saved. I will have my marriage put together. My body will be healed. If God promised it, I've got the right to take it and walk on in the victory. Thanks be unto God. I pray each and every one of you take this message that you reach out and take what you've lost. If you need somebody to talk to, 678 Four seven two nine four nine four. JubileeMinistries.org if you want to send us an email or an offering, either one. There's a donate button on there. If you want to write a personal letter, you can write it to Jubilee Ministries 5009 Lake Miriam Circle, Lakeland, Florida, 33813. If you have an offering, you can send it that way. Some of you do. I love you. There's something brewing, saints. I'm feeling that axe head swimming this way even now. Hallelujah to God. I sense that axe head swimming right back into your hand. The very hand that let it slip. What mercy, what compassion God has that the very hand that let it slip off reaches down and takes it back. Good God, thank you. We love you. God bless you. See you Thursday night, 7.15 for the Zoom class. You are missing it if you're not taking this class. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to beg you to come, but you're missing it. I love you. Thank you for everything. Please keep praying. Pray that the more we take in, the more we can give away. Amen. God bless you.